Welcome to the Museum of FIT's Reinvention and Restlessness Fashion in the 90s Virtual Symposium. My name is Tania Melendez Escalante, and I am Senior Curator of Education and Public Programs. It is my honor to introduce Alexandra Sampson, who will present the talk, Martin Margiela, 1989 to 1999. Alexandra Sampson is a fashion historian, curator, and head of the Haute Couture and Contemporary Design Department at the Palais Galliera, Paris Fashion Museum. A graduate in Museum Studies and History of Fashion from the Ecole du Louvre, in 2018, he presented the Margiela Galliera 1989-2009 exhibition and published his first book in collaboration with Martin Margiela, followed by the travel, traveling exhibition, Backside, Fashion from Behind, presented in Brussels and then Paris in 2019. We hope you enjoy the show. So hello, my name is Alexandre Sanson, and I'm very happy to be here, to be invited by the FIT for this talk about Martin Margiela during the 90s. Um, at Palais Galliera, the Fashion Museum of Paris, I'm the curator in charge of haute couture and uh, contemporary creation. So I have the chance to work on the pieces on the collection of Martin Margiela and the Palais Galliera. I had a very uh, early collection of um, pieces because it's it started to, to collect um, clothes from the designers directly from the showroom since uh, his second collection for Fall Winter 89. In 2018, I had the opportunity and chance to curate the retrospective dedicated to Marta Margiela at Palais Galliera, which presented his work on women design from his first collection, Spring Summer 89, to his last for Spring Summer 2009. Margiela was born in Belgium in 1957 and studied from 1976 to 1980 at the Antwerp Fine Art Academy. And when he applied, uh, teachers recommended him not to work on fashion, but to work on arts uh, after checking his files. But Marta Margiela did um, explicitly clear that he wanted to work on clothes. There, he was one year older than six of his fellow students who will later be known as the Antrep Six. The designers are Anne de Mulmester, Marie Nagy, Dries van Noten, Walter van Beringdong, Dirk van Sen, and Dirk Beckenbergs. In spite of their friendship, Margiela won't follow this group and will work on his career alone. He won several prizes, such as La Canette d'Or, a Belgian prize, where the jury uh, was composed by Jean-Paul Gauthier and Jenny Mayrens, the owner of a fashion boutique in Bruxelles, who will become soon his business partner a few years later. And in 1984, Marta Margiela insisted in working with Jean-Paul Gauthier as an assistant designer for his second brands, such as Gauthier Jeans. This experience teach Margiela how a fashion wo house works, how making connections, with the most important actors and meet the suppliers. But Marta Margiela got also inspired by some Gauthier signature creation, such as this can transformed as a bracelet, um, and he, he learned how to work with repurposing material. In 1987, he left Gauthier and worked alone during one year on the opening of Maison Martin Margiela, gathering collaborators and manufacturers around him. He started he started with Jenny Merens and asked her to become the director of the house in charge of the administration and commercial parts. One of the key to understand Margiela's work and is important for the history of contemporary fashion is the consistency of his work, started with his very first collection. Since then, Margiela favored the anonymity of his models by covering their faces with chiffon veils. This echoed, of course, the increasing success of the rise of the supermodels during the decade. Even if he gave a quick bow at the end of his very first show, Margiela quickly decided to step back from public life to give no portrait and no interview. This to preserve his private life and his freedom when designers gained in the 90s a superstar, superstar status, proved by the intense exposure, such as the one um, with happened when, um, during the murder of Jenny Versace, which was highly covered by the media in 1997. 
this process of anonymity, Margiela applied it also to the cloth itself by choosing a white blank label attached by four stitches, visible on the neck of the non-layered jackets and pants meant to be removed. Although his lawyer prevented him to use this label, Margiela had no problems and even protected both his label on its stitches in 1998. Another key to understand his work is that he didn't lack the IT at all, and especially all the design uh, models of the 80s. When he created his first um, design for the spring summer 89 collection, everything was in reaction to this decade he hated. The shoulder line, for instance, for his first collection, Margela invented a shoulder line that he used during the whole 90s. You know, shoulder lines that breaks from the wide shoulder that had been in style since the late 70s in fashion. These shoulders were narrow and tight. The sleeve cap, situated well above the actual shoulder, was raised thanks to a large cigarette, inserted with minimal gathering. Below, two dots accentuated the curve of the actual shoulder, while a gusset on the back seemed al allowed the arm to move easily. This first model, developed during the whole decade, proved instantly the tailoring skills of the designer. While it's quite rare for a designer to invent a shoulder line, Margiela will develop 12 different examples during his career. The color white is also in reaction of the 80s. Margiela used it to uniform the interiors of his fashion studio, while other designers privileged colors such as blue or black and design object in glass or metal. But moreover, it was also an economic gesture for this young designer to paint his whole house in white. The location are also of a major importance. For his very beginning, Marta Margiela presented his collection in unexpected locations. Until the beginning of the 90s, most designers presented their collection in huge white tents set up in the Musée du Louvre. Margiela will impose underground location as signature for his shows. For the first collection of the decade, the spring summer 90, the designer wanted to create a manifesto as a show. Surprised, shocked and amused, guests arrived at the open lot, a wasteland, which was surrounded by buildings and a wall covered with graffiti in the 20th district of Paris. And Margiela even invited neighborhood children who helped in drawing the invitations. Marta Margiela was aware of the importance of this new era. To mark the change of decade, Margiela had all these models wear the number 90, which was taped, drawn, embroidered, printed, or even painted on their outfits or bodies. The so number nine is a double reference at once to the designer's birthday and to the name of this company. The symbolic impact was so important. Journalists made comparison with the wall of Berlin, which fall one month after. As Bill Cunningham said in the, in the magazine details, in insight, this evening in Paris, in its own way, foreshadowed the political and social collapse of the Eastern Europe. Clearly, Margiela's collection signaled not only the dawn of a new decade, but also that of a talented designer gifted with the necessary authority and power to open new pathways. Again, there was several locations such as nightclub, a warehouse, a parking, an abandoned train station in Paris, or the Salvation Army headquarters where guests seated on second hand washing machine. This love for surprising people is a link throughout all his career and another important key to understand his work. His creations are showing the same taste for the unexpected. The trompe l'oeil, for instance, is very strong in his collection. For his very first show, he worked on a tattoo shirt inspired by French Polynesian tattoos. For spring summer 96, he worked on a two-dimensional collection without cut or structure. Negative of, of photograph of clothing were print on fluid or transparent materials, the only volume provided by the trompe l'oeil image. The trompe l'oeil also worked for all the makeups he designed with the makeup artist Inge Gronia. 
but one of the most important design motivated by trompe l'oeil might be the tabby boots. As early as his first collection, Marta Margiela thought to create an invisible shoe, one that would provide the illusion of a barefoot placed on a sole with a heel. During a visit to Japan in April 84, he discovered the Jika tabi, so sock booties with a separated toe worn especially by construction workers, artisans, and gardeners. The tabi would continue to be featured for the next 20 years, appearing in many forms and in a wide array of materials. His first dream came true for the spring summer 96 show. The models was invisible tabby on the feet. The tabby soles made of black leather with a high cylindrical heel were affixed with white transparent tape wrapped several times around the foot. The work on scale is also a constant obsession for the designer. For his spring 90, he experienced an oversized man tank top enlarged by 200% then worn as a skirt. For the fall winter 92, he found at the flea market an, Amer an American dress form from um, 1936, which was a size 44, or an Italian size 78, and draped a huge plastic dress bag on it to create a massive floating plastic dress on a classic woman body. Launched in 1994 and produced until 1999, the doll's wardrobe from the 60s and the 70s was reproduced and brought up to human size. The exact cut and disproportions were respected. The buttonholes became false, covered by jean snaps, while the jersey and knit were enlarged to the max. No brand's name appeared here. Instead, there was a printed cotton tag explaining the designer's process. This tag, Margiela used the same again for his replica line. Offered as part of the Autumn Winter 94-95 collection, the replicas offered a concrete manifestation of Martha Margiela's abiding interest, presents in his first collection for replicas of antique clothing. I like clothes I didn't invent, said the designer who went so far as to precisely reproduce the proportions or disproportions of the selected garments. A lady's skirt suit, the first of his career from Belgium, dating from the late 40s, and a men's suit from the early 70s were faithfully reproduced, as were a nun's raincoat on, on the petticoat from the 30s. Out of respect for these garments and their anonymous makers, Marta Margiela was never to brand these items with his blank label. Instead, they have a layer, large square of printed cotton bearing a detailed description of the piece, its origin and its era. On online articles, is the, the stitches of the label show through on the back. Thus was launched Maison Marta Margiela replica line, comprising faithful reproduction of antique clothing. But the most important Margiela's proposition was surely the artisanal line made from reclaimed and upcycled garments and objects. Marta Margiela's artisanal line truly became a reality in 1990 when it was granted a dedicated workshop at the company's head offices. Objects were proposed as clothing appeared as early as the designer's second collection in the form of spontaneous impulses but it was receiving the 1990 Andam Prize that finally made it possible to create a workshop bringing together the necessary skills and savoir-faire to develop the artisanal line. This is how it came to be that for spring summer 1991, war garments found at flea markets among other sources were sorted, washed, over dyed, or bleached and disassembled to then be transformed into one of a kind pieces. To the journalist who considers his action iconoclastic, if not outright disrespectful, Magella responded, when I cut up a garment, whether old or new, I don't think that I'm destroying it. It's a way of giving it a new life in a different form. But the first time in the history of fashion, a designer offered new pieces that was entirely made of reclaimed, upcycled articles, calling into question fashion relentless need to constantly renew itself. 
The artisan online will be recognized at Haute Couture Manifestation for the spring summer 2006 season. But far from several interpretations, this process was not motivated by sustainability. It was before everything an economical way of working with unlimited material, which joined his love for garment from the past, a gesture of repurposing that we could also find in the 70s. The 1990s are a major moment in the work of Margiela, where all his main ideas were developed. But the acme of the era occurred in 1997, when he presented two collections, known as the Stockman Collection, which are still considered the most representative and the most radical of his work. All of the outfits were made from a single item, which formed the basis for both seasons a hollowed out stockman dress form worn as a stiff jacket in raw linen. All of the pieces in the collection were placed over the stockman jacket, just as in the studio the work is first done on dress form. Each garment was presented in an incomplete state, from half skirts and half coats to studies of drapery. All the collection came from this. Wishing to understand Haute Couture draping technique, Magella took a course with a modeling and draping professor at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts of Antwerp. Magella was so pleased with his initial work that he used it as a bustier and not a draped dress as might have been expected. The Spring Summer 97 collection was one of the most impressive in the designer career and one of the most significant propositions in the history of contemporary fashion. During the 90s, Marta Mangela never stopped questioning fashion, clothing, and its function. He addressed the concept of scale, enlarging doll's clothes and oversized styles, and the deconstruction of classic garments to create a new shape. shape. He was one of the only designers to invent a new silhouette. He revealed the inside of clothes and the different steps of the fabrication. He used imperfections as motif, garments that were, for instance, unfinished, frayed, and torn, and he examined the role of vintage clothing. These last two were specifically addressed in his artisanal line. He worked with son play, favored the color white, the anonymous label, and, amongst other things, he can reconsider the role played by models and by the designer. During the second half of his career, Magella will deal with his characteristic in death, staying true to the consistency which made him one of the most interesting and quoted designer of the turn of the century. <laughs> 